Um, and I don't know what really I was expected to do, but last week when we said, let's carry on the discussions, um, I thought this has been on my mind for a long time. <clears throat> and what I've sort of said, uh, for those people who might not have had a look, is that it's concerning for me that we don't use the term black anymore. One of the reasons that it's sometimes argued that we don't is because perhaps we don't share as many struggles as we used to between the different migrant populations. And by that, I'm sort of really focusing on South Asian and Africa and Afro-Caribbean sort of struggles. Um, so in the you know, 70s and 80s, that was a, a good way, at least political activists thought that it was appropriate to organize around anti-colonial, anti-imperialist, socialist sort of struggles around the notion of black because they shared that sort of thinking. And then in, from the sort of late 80s onwards, um, and uh, into the early 90s, that, that sort of way of organising gets very dissipated and people start arguing for plurality that, um, you know, black people are not uh, one type of people, that there are Asians, and then there are Sikhs, and then there are Muslims, and then there are East African Asians, and all sorts of different dimensions, which are important, you know, when we're looking at particular needs and trying to analyze different ways in which migration has affected people and their, you know, perhaps class positions, etc. Those are all very important things to look at. But when we're organizing in a sort of a political sense, then I think that black has been, the concept of black as a political notion has been a very um, important one. And I'm always very sad to sort of lose it and I, you know people of color uh, I, I really don't know what that means um, so what I've tried to do you know towards the end of that is to say that there are still lots of commonalities particularly actually increasing commonalities apart from the um, socio-economic condition of some groups of um, South Asian mm -hmm. people um, you know, particularly Muslims, Bangladeshis, and that they're, they're still, sociologically speaking, um, there are lots of ways in which they're still marginalised. Um, but also black, you know, if we're talking about black, then there are lots of African migrants nowadays that are also black. So it's not just an Afro-Caribbean, um, you know, sort of struggle. And black has always been a pan-African sort of concept in any case. And so the sorts of things that I've, I've said that, you know, that if you look at prison population, that affects a lot of black people um, and Muslim populations. Again, that Muslims can also be African. Um, if we look at you know, the number of stop and searches and the relationship to the police, etc., all that is very similar. And what's been happening in the context of war and terror in terms of Guantanamo Bay and Abu Ghraib, um, that always reminded me of the sort of lynching that's always, you know, that's gone on and the way in which um, particularly men have been humiliated um, as, as a sort of a real sign of white supremacy and white masculinity as well. Uh, and then, you know, if we're looking at gangs, drugs, etc., all, all of those sort of areas are where both Muslim communities and Afro-Caribbeans particularly have, have shared or are sharing a lot of these experiences. So for me, these are grounds that could be advocated as common areas of struggle and upon which political unity can be built. But I suppose as always, it, it is a um, question of political will. Um, but I've just wondered why these areas haven't been highlighted as commonalities for solidarity. That's all. That's it. <laughs> okay. No more to say. <coughs> yeah.
you know the South Asia, uh, South Asia, South Asia have particular problems and uh, struggles that are that are you know that are South Asia uh, based in the in their community and also in the subcontinent. So I mean, uh, we're involved in BAME groups, but we also got our own uh, struggles as well, any. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we have, and, but those struggles, <coughs> as important as they might be in my mind, are still here, at least, in the context of racism. We've got more to share than, than those differences. Uh, identity politics, there seems to be a backlash against identity politics by people on the, on the right and also on the left as well. What do you... Uh, the comrades think about that. Can I just report on, I went to a meeting, uh, which I thought was going to be a meeting organized by people in Birmingham who've been active with the Black, Black uh, Lives Matter movement. Uh, and it was led by two individuals. Uh, and I found out later that one of them is a, was a Tory candidate for somewhere. Uh, and I think the arguments they made was uh, they, they invited us all to come. And they said, we've got together here to see how we can tackle the issues uh, and what are the issues. Uh, and they said the primary issue is underrepresentation of Afro Caribbean people uh, in, in the city uh, uh, and nationally as well, I suppose. So what they have decided they're going to be concentrating on, uh, and I think Charlie Williams was one of the other organizers for this, uh, is to create a political party uh, that is going to resolve the problem of underrepresentation, uh, and it will be funded by the churches, uh, and uh, that that's, and on that basis, they said anybody who's here can either be a friend, an affiliate, or a member, depending upon what you, uh, to what extent you want to support them. Uh, so if you want to be a candidate or whatever, but I mean, I suppose it would only apply if you're an Afro-Caribbean to be a candidate, but you can join the party uh, and they will have the whole set, the manifesto, everything up to national level. I don't know how that's going to work out, but that's, that's what they're saying. They have, and in fact, what transpired is the people in the Midlands or in Birmingham, uh, and they were actually people from Coventry, Wolverhampton, Dudley, uh, have, a lot of them have actually left the BLM movement because BLM movement has been all encompassing on the basis of anti-colonial and their support for Palestine and everything else they thought was risky for them. Uh, because it raises the issue of anti-Semitism and whatever. Uh, and as it happened, Salma Yaqub was there and she raised the points as well, and so did I. But uh, uh, I think that's something to keep in mind. Now, whether that's a general trend within the Afro-Caribbean community or not, I don't know. I'll just pick up uh, Surinder's point about commonality and difference. <clears throat> I suppose a lot depends upon what you choose to focus upon at any given time. So the, the actual commonality of South Asian and Caribbean heritage uh, people um, is, of course, a common experience of the British Empire and imperialism. But then conversely, the experience of the British Empire and imperialism um, meant different things for different groups of people. So the experience of plantation slavery, <clears throat> which mostly affected people of African origin, um, is not quite the same as experience of the British Raj. So, and th those differences are replicated um, in this country today. So, you know, there are some historical uh, impediments to commonalities and there are historical 
points of unification. And it's a matter of, it's a matter of what people choose to stress at any given time. And these things go in, go in waves and cycles. Um, uh, so it's hardly surprising to, to realise that at any given point in time, uh, there's disunity and, and other points in time, there's a kind of harmony. It's, that would be quite natural, wouldn't it? Um, I mean, for example, um, there, unbeknown to most observers, there's often hidden tension between people of, Af people of African Caribbean origin and people of African origin, which reflects uh, the dimensions of the slave trade several hundred years ago. So tensions between people who you know who come from or parents come from Africa and people come from the Caribbean and because because of how the slave trade was processed. So there are all sorts of tensions and differences between between um, this collective called black people. And, and that's also obviously true in terms of uh, relative economic success rates in this country. So as I think Sarinda pointed out, uh, Muslims in particular, but especially Bangladeshi Muslims, um, have been economically very, very disadvantaged. But conversely, there are sections of the black community, um, black communities um, who, who have been very successful in terms of uh, economic progress. Uh, so there are differences. So um, what do you choose to focus upon? My point is that the areas that are pointed to, they could be areas of commonality around which we could organise, or people yes, could yes. organise. Yeah, and I don't yeah. understand why they haven't been, um, as I said, you know, promoted as, as such. Well, there is, of course, and isn't there a well-established uh, hierarchy of peoples, which goes back to the British Empire, um, and, and that hierarchy of peoples uh, is still prevalent, and, and that permeates everybody's everybody's thinking. Um, you know, Can I, um, you know, coming back to my previous example, I think the one of the arguments they used in saying that the Afro-Caribbean need a political party for themselves is because, I mean, and I think I, they are justified in saying what they said, was the way they, have been, they had been treated, particularly in Birmingham. So for example, there was Mosquito uh, was going to be a candidate for, uh, for the Labour Ladywood war, uh, constituency, but he was, because of the influence used by, uh, what's her name? Uh, Mahmoud, uh, right. he she didn't uh, she didn't get the Labour seat. Uh, well, she wasn't selected as a Labour candidate, and uh, it was primarily because Mahmoud's father had influence in the Labour Party. Uh, so that was one aspect of it. Then the other one was on the elections for the police commissioner. Again, there was a black candidate, and it was superseded by uh, by a white person and I think even now Momentum has got that candidacy uh, uh, is a Labour candidate and uh, Mosquito, well whoever was the previous, uh, I think she was the uh, assistant commissioner, uh, she didn't get the chance. Uh, so I think you know there are there are valid reasons I and mean, I think what they were saying also well in the Birmingham City Council uh, the Asians are fairly well represented. Uh, Afro-Caribbeans are not. There isn't a single Afro-Caribbean man on the uh, on the Labour uh, Council at the moment. So there, I mean, there, and, and it, it dates back to you know quite a long time. That has been the situation. Uh, it may not be across the country, but certainly in Birmingham. But I think even in the Parliament, there is. The, the representation of Afro-Caribbean is lower. Mm. And it may apply to Bangladeshis as well, I think. Coming back to Surinder's 
uh, coming back to Surinder's point, the, the question she was she raised is that why, from our perspective or from a general sort of perspective, we can see that there are commonalities of struggle, uh, uh, commonalities of issues, and why we cannot, uh, why these communities are not building up solidarity platforms to come together to in these struggles. But then the question is that who is this perspective coming from? It's generally the perspective is coming from the left, this perspective of that ought to be a solidarity or more, um, yeah. or, or we can also say that this perspective of seeing the commonalities of the struggles is coming from the left. That is left has a particular nucleus of its own identity. And therefore they, th therefore they highlight certain particular issues as more important compared to other issues. Whereas if we talk to people who are Afro-Caribbean or Christian Afro-Caribbean compared to Muslim Afro-Caribbeans or South Asians, uh, they would not have the same elements as the primary elements of their identity. Therefore, these issues are not highlighted as prime issues uh, or the issues over which they can uh, build solidarity. Uh, for example, if we take South Asia, South Asia, do South Asians face similar sort of struggles here, here migrants? Yes, pretty much, yes, they do. But do you think that, do we think that South Asians here um, see themselves as South Asians? No, not anymore. I mean, Kashmiri South Asians, Kashmiri Muslims will see themselves as themselves. Indian Hindus will see themselves as separate entity and so on and so forth, similarly Christians and so on. So uh, the, 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 I think the answer lies somewhere in how the identity of these groups whom we are seeing as some sort of homogeneous, sort of a, uh, some sort of a group which has a commonality of struggle, uh, how these groups are constructing their identities and how their identities are in some cases loggerheads with each other. Uh, and that is why you can see the, uh, the tensions, like what Paul was saying is a very important point that you have tensions, uh, not very much highlighted between the Afro-Caribbeans and Africans. And that is, uh, that's something, there is more than and something there. Mm. Yeah, but there's something called, um, I come across this phrase some time ago by some critical race theorists and this person talked about the flatness of blackness, mm. the flatness of blackness and meaning by that, that uh, there's, not a, there's not a homogenized um, community called black people. Um, it's 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 diverse, rich, and very different combination of people, often broken down to ethnicity and religion, um, and of course, increasingly a class dimension. So, the, 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 now I mentioned that the Tory candidate at the meet, Black, Black Lives Matters meeting. Well, I'm sure I'm sure he promotes. I'm sure he's going to be promoting the right to become a black become a black capitalist. Oh, that doesn't particularly interest me. You know, um, if equal opportunity means I've got a right to become a black capitalist, like a white capitalist, and exploit people, I don't find that very appealing. So, so with, within the flatness of blackness, there are diverse political perspectives, um, some of which I would find reactionary and non progressive. So, so, this goes back to the issue about raised by surrender the relationship between class class and 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 um and black communities um it's very very diverse and, and why we expect to be different you know the white communities are are divided by class um, and ideas about how the world should be organized um why on earth would we expect that to be any different for black communities that's a that's a part of a less racism a less um, blinkered perspective to assume that all black people are the same. Um, think, and it's blatantly not true. I think we need, we need to look at it from another perspective because racism is not just about prejudice. It's, it's we know prejudice, that. Yeah. Yeah. prejudice with power. So 
So if yeah. you're prejudiced and you have got the power, then you 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 can be a racist. Uh, but if you if you're prejudiced, you don't like white people full stop. But you haven't got the power to do anything about it. It doesn't bother me. It doesn't. It shouldn't bother white people because you don't affect them. But I think what what we've got to go is to go back to the reality itself, which is I mean I can give you an ex extreme example of the United States, where it is it is actually the uh, American Africans uh, who are actually being killed by the police, not not the Asians. All right. Yeah. There is no commonality, all right, in reality, there, there is, there is there, that commonality doesn't exist. And when I gave the example of Birmingham also, the, you know, we, we, we may idealize, you know, that it's, it's all common, it's all colonialism, uh, which it is, all right, but there is, there is a reality on which a perception is based that the Afro-Caribbeans are least represented all right, and that itself is a problem. So you can't you can't say let's be you know uh, ethical about this and join together because we have so many commonalities. We've got to address that lack of representation uh, because that's what the Afro-Caribbean person will see and will tell you. I mean, it's like the same as you know working class as well. Yes, but it is all working class struggle. Let's go and get rid of capitalism and we will sort it everything else. I think it's, I mean, there is, there is the other side of it, which is this identity politics would then allow you to fight for the crumbs between yourselves. Uh, and that is the negative aspect. But the reality of it is because that perception is based on reality, people are going to struggle against that. Mm. I, I think the issue about representation is a bit of a red herring in one sense, because even if institutions like the police, education and all other institutions reflected the demographics of the country, it still means that black people be, be in a very small minority. It doesn't mean there's a transfer of power, does it? So this idea of representation as per demographics, um, doesn't get us very far, not in practice. It's obviously better or desirable, um, and it may be better part of anti-racist struggle, but it's not a panacea. You know, it, it doesn't work that way. You know, Joe. Well, what, 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 what's the South Asian African population in terms of percentages in Britain? It's about what, about 14%. You know, it means that the majority of people, the 86%, are not black people, you know, the odds yeah. are against black people. Yeah. I, I, agree with all that. Arguments. I agree with all that. It's, it's the same argument that I've had with many in the left. They're saying, well, you know, China is not a socialist country. So I say to them is, well, China never set out to be a socialist country. It, it set out to get rid of colonialism or to get rid of foreign occupation. And that's what it succeeded in doing. Mm. All right. Everything else you know, why haven't you got socialism in, uh, in the West? That's your fault. Uh, so, I mean, I think people are going to struggle I mean, and the Afro-Caribbeans are going to struggle on that basis. I think, oh. yeah. Sorry, yeah. Um, uh, Surinda, thank you. Uh, I, I, thank you for setting out the, um, you know, um, issues in that article. I thought that was very clear. And I think you brought out the, various topics as well. So I think that was, that was very good. Um, I think we've talked about this before. Um, it, it, in, the, in the 80s, uh, in, in, in England anyway, in the UK, um, we had a lot of struggles, but particularly against immigration, uh, immigration laws that were being enforced, in, you know, that came in in the 70s, but they were actually being enacted in 80s. So there was a lot of campaigns that actually um, were run. So there was activism and also struggle and that actually um, both African, Caribbean and uh, Asian uh, people were affected. Um, so, in, you know, in West Midlands, we had all three groups. So there was actually a point, um, point of action that was united anyway and the struggle was same. So that 
that worked. But there was also the whole black power ideology and um, and also a lot of uh, um, anti-imperialist struggles. I mean, we were just coming out of the uh, Vietnam War and all that sort of fight, fight against uh, um, imperialists and um, Latin Americans. So there was a lot of political activity, which over the years, and I think it's, uh, I think it's been successfully um, fought off by um, talking about various social policies that divide us in various categories. So religious categories, and then, as you said, various national categories. So, uh, um, I mean, now, so now we're talking about uh, all our experiences or identities are different. We don't see any commonalities. You know, so the emphasis has been actually taken taken to the differences rather than the unity. And I think that's been the, that's definitely has been the aim of the various policies, government uh, policies, I would say. Um, uh, policies are always um, differentiating between migrant populations anyway, isn't it? Yes. You have the whole I mean, Section 11 funding and... Exactly, and but that, that's consciously been done. I think that's been encouraged to actually emphasize the difference. Uh, because as you, as you said in the thing, gangs, I mean, they, they're in Birmingham, there are Afro-Caribbean gangs, you know, in, in where we live, in Hansworth, in Newtown, they were. Um, and they were using guns and then there's Muslim ga gangs in Park Hill and you know so they, they, they're all different types they, but they themselves would not necessarily find any kind of common ground uh, against police or whatever they're, they're going to fight their own battles there's not any overarching organization and I think that's that's actually been promoted by various policies um, but um, I, I I think Saif is right that uh, pe people don't see, uh, I mean, uh, I definitely see that. People don't uh, see themselves as part of overall big, big group, you know, um, like I think they used to in the, in the 80s. And that has changed. Uh, so there's both political and ideological changes as well as... Um, and particularly, I mean, when the uh, anti-terrorist laws came in um, and the Muslim community was affected, I mean, there's quite a lot of um, in, in Indians, Hindus and Sikhs said that it's not us, you know, quite openly, I mean, said that, isn't it? So, you know, the identities actually seem to have divided us rather than help to end encourage us to get together and see these points that were, well, they seem a bit clearer in the 70s and 80s, I think. I, I, don't, I mean... I don't know, because I, I think, on the, you know, in terms of people's experiences, I don't think these experiences are any more um, opaque than, you know, were in the 70s and 80s. They're, they're very real experiences. Um, I suppose it's about that subjectivity and his, um, history, I suppose, like, you know, we're saying that people's uh, psychology, mentalities and identities are shaped by what's gone on before, as well as what's going on in the present. But, you know, it just seems a shame to me because, you know, there are all these similarities that are going on, but there doesn't seem to be any coherent sort of analysis of how how these you know these similarities do cut across different sorts of populations and and yet like you say for instance the Lamy review raised these areas very clearly that there is there are these similarities between different sections of the population but politically it doesn't seem to get picked up well, I, I think it's more deliberate the politically the I, I think as you said the funding Funding has been given in the various community organizations on either religious basis or ethnic basis, you know, rather than community basis. So there's the differences has been differences have been promoted that way. 
you know, rather than saying Hansworth will get X amount of money to improve whatever whatever's needed, education or whatever. It's been given to 10 different groups to do in their own little group, you know, they all, all have to bid for that money. Mm. So you, so different people then are spending a lot of their time and effort and things to actually do the changes, even though they might actually agree on the change needed. The way it's actually funded, it's or encouraged. My way to approach this is to, is to try to realign issues of racism um, and experience of black communities per se. Um, with evolving class positions within black communities. So to me, it's fairly powerfully evident that working class black peoples, whether of South Asian or Caribbean heritage, um, share a common class position. And this is most obvious, this is most obvious in the case of policing, which has become the focus of Black Lives Matters. So the institution of Policism with structural racism affects both South Asian and Caribbean heritage uh, citizens in terms of police behaviour, police surveillance. So whether it's sus laws, whether it's surveillance, whether it's anti-terrorist laws, um, there's a large swathe of black people um, um, who share a, a common class position um, who are the uh, super victims of police surveillance. So, so that, that is a commonality uh, which, which can be brought out. Um, and I think that's an interesting tactic for all concerned to, to, to demonstrate that uh, in spite of differences, there are commonalities. Um, and the most powerful one is, is, is the relationship of black working class communities in particular um, whether we talk about South Asian or, or African Caribbean, even African communities, um, and 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 uh, the way the police operate. So, so, so where whereas the police um, are meant to provide a public service, meant to provide an ethos of public safety, uh, when it comes to the experience of working class black peoples. It's complete opposite. It's experience of punishment, control, and surveillance. So there's a, there's a very common, very common direct element, but it does combine a class perspective as well. Mm. How was the, sorry, but how was the programs in the eighties? How was the black programs? Uh, how, how did they run? And how did they, I mean, what were the underlying things that you, I mean, obviously policing, but how did the idea, what was the ideology behind it? Was it uh, socialism and, uh, you know, to unite the, the black and the Asian community uh, and to fight together? Was it under socialism? And how did, and what kind of things did they do apart from, uh, apart from uh, tackling the police, uh, the, the police racism? Kelvin, you wanted to speak. Oh no no go um go ahead name. No go no, you go on. No no honestly. No go on. <laughs> um I need to rethink my question. Okay. Sorry go go. <laughs> but I think uh, we we've got to understand that, dif that there's a different terrain compared to what was in the 70s and the 80s. Uh, and uh, in fact you see blacks and Asians were predominantly uh, in terms of racism on the street were were suffering the same in terms of being beaten up by the National Front, being called, you know, go home and everything else. And the immigration law affected, I think, much more the, the whole population of migrants rather than just one particular sector. I mean, but now you see, I mean, even the Windrush affected the Afro-Caribbean much, much more than other people. So I think that's one aspect of it. The SUS laws also affect the Afro-Caribbean community much, much more than anybody else. But there is, there is a grievance there, which can be used for all sorts of purposes, which is actually, you know, the Asian communities have done it as well. Uh, but, you know, it's, the Asian community is not a monolith and the black is no longer the same monolith because 
we didn't face the same train, we didn't face the same national front who was targeting both of us, all right? What is happening now is different to what was happening in the 70s and 80s. And therefore- I'm saying that say for instance, well. sus, sus laws, for instance, affect African Caribbeans and Muslims as a, as a general uh, community, but also African Muslims. Yes, African. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, I know that, yeah. But still, so, I think that should be brought out a lot more than mm. than it is. Mm. But you can't, oh, sorry, change, but you can't change the reality either, isn't it? I mean, I've given you several examples in Birmingham, for example. All right, in terms of representation, there is a big deficit, and I think even in tough laws, the the, the Afro Caribbean community is much more targeted. Uh, I mean, there are other things that affect the Muslim community. Uh, um, in terms of people going to prison and everything else, and also being victims of anti-terrorist laws. Uh, but the terrain has changed, even in that respect. You see, it's not, we are no longer South Asians. So, you know, different people sit in different uh, and suffer different uh, aspects of, of racism. I think in answer to what uh, was said, what, what was different, I, I don't think there was any particular sort of socialist program or anything, but uh, there seemed to be a lot more re reaching of hands between different communities to fight a particular struggle. So uh, there were numerous local campaigns about false imprisonment or that, that sort of thing that were going on. And people of communities seemed to join into those those rather than you know which is which was mixed asian caribbean and white people they seem to be able to unite against a particular campaign if you like it seemed to happen a lot more than is happening now i think well what, what was different in the 80s was in the 70s was that uh there was identified a common enemy um in overt far right movements like the national front yeah. Um, and, and, and that united both uh, the white left and the South Asian and Caribbean peoples together as a common enemy. Um, uh, so, so when you look about unifying movements and solidarities, it's not just what you should be having in common in terms of experience, it's also who you identify to be your common enemy. Uh, but it's very overt in the 70s and 80s. Um, you know, the far right have gone, undergone transformations and become much more sophisticated in the past 20, 30 years. And, and what they do now is they engage in what's called this, this hybrid racism, whereby they, they, they subvert racism under the guise of Islamophobia. So, so the far right now, at least in their public, public personas, um, they, they speak about... Um, the threats from from the Muslim community. So this kind of a uh, the, the far right rhetoric has transmuted into not against immigrants per se, but against a certain sort of so-called immigrant, which is those with a Muslim religious background. And quite clearly, if, if you're a Christian, and if you're a Christian Caribbean person, um, you might be you might buy into that anti anti-Muslim rhetoric. Um, so. And now, now we know, of course, that people who study the far right and, and track their behaviour, uh, that in, in private meetings, they remain deeply anti-Semitic and they remain deeply anti-black. Anti but their public persona is around Islamophobia and the threats of um, uh, the, 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 the de-civilising of Europe through, through, through mass immigration of Muslims. Uh, this so-called this, um, this fear of being swamped by an alien culture, um, and in that sense, they've been very, very successful. They managed to manage to divide the left of the white and the black because of this. So, so we are also victims of the far right's reemergence in a much more sophisticated form. But they remain the same common enemy, and um, that's the point we've got to bear in mind. I mean, uh, this group we could still form as a black caucus with white allies, but you know, uh, it depends. I mean, we could get involved in campaigns and stuff, 
But what do you think about that? Well, people are involved in campaigns in different ways, aren't you know? All of us here are involved in different <coughs> campaigns in different ways, you know. Um, um, it's, I mean, to channel, to channel our energies together, united, mm -hmm. uh, in, on, a partic on a particular uh, on particular issues that, that pop up, you know, uh, comrades could uh, flag them up and we could all, so like, say, for instance, we could go on to a, a Zoom event and sort of work together and stuff. Depending how much t free time, I mean, how much time comrades have got, you know, I mean, we could form our own group with this. Uh, uh, with, the, with these numbers in, in this, in this uh, reading group? Mm. I mean, if you, if you take uh, the Black Lives Matter movement, then the subtext is um, that this is, is, is actually about the experiences of Black African heritage men. Um, the South Asian dimension um, is barely present. I mean, it's an omission. But uh, the whole thrust of Black Lives Matters, as far as I can tell, especially in America, but true elsewhere in Europe and elsewhere in, in Britain, is that the focus is very much upon the experience of people from, um, from, from Africa. Um, there's a lacuna in regards to the experience of South Asian people. And um, so, so maybe unwittingly, the Black Lives Matters focus has managed to without realising it, perpetuate divisions within black communities. Um, for example, um, although I see a lot of uh, young white people in support of Black Lives Matters, um, I may be wrong, but from my observations, I see very few South Asian people in support, publicly demonstrating. Um, if I'm wrong, tell me, but that's my observation. So that, that illustrates the point that uh, Black Lives Matters um, um, it's, it's really been around the African, ex Af African experience uh, uh, through experience of slavery and, and colonialism. Um, so yet again, there's an example of um, a potentially revolutionary movement, um, almost by definition, by self-selection, um, has become um, covertly divided. Just to add on what Saif and Paul said about the difference, the lack of homogeneity amongst black people and Asians. So surely the fact that there's so much divisions, there's so much variations in amongst blacks and Asians in regards to income, class, politics, all of those would contribute to the lack of unity Absolutely. and the, the incentive to unite. So say, right-wing high-income Asians of which likewise there might be of black people with the same characteristics there might be few of them they, they may feel that they may not feel at the same way about black lives matter mm. and the lack of the fact but then on the other hand working class Asians may feel may feel more strongly towards it because they've been in more similar conditions Absolutely. So definitely, we have to consider the heterogeneity amongst both groups. Yeah, yeah. Well, you're stressing a point that class matters. Mm. Uh, one's class location and one's mm. self-consciousness of one's class location um, aligns with one's, one's uh, identity as a black person or a white person. You know, there are commonalities, um, but it's very much derived from a class complementary analysis of experience. Um, I mean, look at our current Tory government, look at um, our Home Secretary, you know, um, uh, who's dismissive of Black Lives Matters, you know, um, uh, and look at their attitudes towards working class people, you know, I mean, that illustrates just because you're black doesn't make you radical, doesn't make you progressive, doesn't make you revolutionary. Um, so this big issue around uh, class and uh, racial identity um, is a complex one, but it's, I think it's a key to any progress. Yes, I, th I, think, uh, I think that's right, because the more recent immigration from, um, say, India has been in the 
of the middle class and the industrialists and things so much more you know completely different to the earlier um, uh, earlier immigration which was more in the working class section so there has been changing even in the immigration into UK of the class of people that are coming in and that's again been encouraged by policies of allowing people with certain income to become British citizens etc etc so that's encouraged even more <laughs> yeah I mean it's a very simple equation isn't it if you've got a vested interest in your economic success so if, if you're uh, 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 through dint of hard work and whatever um, you, you've ended up being a professional person with a high income or you own a business and you're being successful then irrespective of who you might be white or black you have a vested interest in the status quo yeah um, you know and those who don't benefit so those at the bottom economic scale with the lowest incomes and the poorest work conditions people who are part of pre precariat um, people of what surrender last week called the underclass um, if you belong to the underclass irrespective of your ethnicity or racial identity then you as an underclass have something very much in common you share the same experience um, in many many respects why are you laughing I just called them underclass sorry I, I just said Murray called them underclass oh, hey. what? Murray, what Charles say? Murray called them underclass. The underclass, think. yeah, you're quoting, yeah, 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 yeah. But it's a good term. It explains quite a bit. I think um, the uh, position in the 70s and 80s wasn't in in reality a single black movement i think primarily there were a lot of struggles going on there were a lot of organizations some of them very small uh, some of them fairly large the organizations generally speaking were based on nationality for the like the IWA um, or um, say it's a pan African groups, um, they got involved in specific struggles, and in many cases, their, their, their struggle against was against racism in some form, and therefore um, it was a common struggle with each other, and they united together for that purpose but they were by no means, um, I think, a, a unified organization. Um, the, the main difference, I think, though, between now and that period is that there were struggles against racism. Um, that they, they were against immigration, against the police brutality, um, against the National Front, against um, uh, struggles in factories and so on. Um, that there were uh, you know there were struggles of, of um, uh, non-white uh, peoples um, either um, it's separate national groups or together um, against against the racist um, state racism and and um, fascist racism and so on um, but today there aren't any I mean the Black Lives Matter is 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 different it's the first one for for a long time and if it works out if it, if it uh, continues as a movement and grows in this country and strengthens then um that that will be quite unique in in recent in the recent period um and within it um although it it is principally concentrating on people um of african background uh, as the main targets of the police there isn't any reason why um, uh, people from other um, national minority groups ca can't unite around it can't support it um, I don't know I, I, whether whether they are not at the moment or not but I don't see any reason why they shouldn't 
but um, I, I think that Trinder is right. There are all these various things that bring people together. And I think particularly the, the, the struggle that the, 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 um, the uh, Pakistani Muslim community and the Afro-Caribbean community are very, very similarly treated uh, by the state. And they have, so they do have an awful lot in common, but they're not actually fighting a struggle against the state at the moment. They're being individually oppressed by the state. It's not the same thing. Um, if they were, you know, movements um, within those communities of struggle against the, the, the state, then I think there would be a basis for them to get together. But I think that the main thing at the moment is that there, there are there are no struggles of that type, apart from now the Black Lives Matter. No, um, you know, if you look at deaths in custody and then all the um, fight against the sort of war on terror thing, the movements around that, they have been engaged against the state. And Islamophobia is very much, you know, the sort of new racism. So in that sense, it is a struggle against racism and against the state, but they don't come together. The question I would ask for in there is that you, you see when the Muslims are fighting against Islamophobia, right? I don't think we said that, you know, we really we must come together because this it's the same class or it's, it's just, you know, we're all black. We, we have to fight individual battles as they come along. And I think we could be making the same mistake as what some have done is, you know, said black life matters, all lives matter, which is true, but it doesn't answer the, the current uh, yeah. problem. And I think that's what we need to be looking at. Yeah, I, I think, you know, the point that Saif raised right at the beginning is that obviously it's my beef, isn't it? It's just something that bugs me as yeah. somebody from the left, but it's not a concern that actually, you know, concerns the movements and stuff. I mean, vis-a-vis -vis, uh, vis -vis this um, anti-terrorism thing, so if you look at anti-terrorism laws, they, they the target Muslim communities, whether they are Somali Muslim community or uh, North African Muslim community or Pakistani, Kashmiri, and so on and so forth. Muslim communities, primarily. So, and all of you are absolutely right that these particular struggles belong to all oppressed groups. These are not, these struggles are not unique struggles in the sense that they should be only focused by the people who are being targeted. But, uh, why don't they? They don't because not only they do not see themselves as Muslim, this is a very shallow sort of point, uh, but they also buy into the Islamophobic narrative. Or I would not say Islam, okay, I will say Islamophobic, but also anti Muslim narrative. That is, Muslimness is a moral evil which has been proposed by, which has been I mean, quite successful. This particular narrative has been quite successful, whether it's in the West or in globally it has been successful and these particular groups even though they are oppressed by the same apparatus um, capitalist white supremacists whatever you want to call it uh, they they buy into this particular narrative so they see these oppressed groups that is the the, the uh, north african muslim community or so on and so forth they see them as deserving of this particular punishment uh, because of their moral feelings and therefore, if they are being subjected to this particular treatment, it is right. It is a corrective measure. It's not a punitive measure. It's not something which is wrong, which is happening to them. But it's something which is something right, which state is doing. Therefore, why should they? In fact, if you talk to a lot of these particular groups, uh, whether they are Indian non-Muslim groups or so on and so forth, or other groups, they will say that, yes, uh, Muslims are problematic, not on, I mean, in different words. And I'm sure we all have this particular kind of experiences that uh, our friends who were, who are in some form and shape on the left, they do see Islam as a problem. 
uh, they might say, okay, Muslims are being victimized, but they see Islam as a fundamentally problematic ideology or a religion, uh, a corrupting influence. Therefore, they might have sympathies with the Muslims, but they do not have sympathies with the, with the core of their identity, that is Islam. And in other words, they want Muslims without Islam, Muslims who do not follow Islam. <laughs> and these particular Muslims are very, very much in vogue among the white left, or you can say Western left. You can see that if you want to be, uh, if you want to gain some sort of political traction among the left, whether this is Western left or Indian left or Chinese left, whatever left, you just all you have to do is you have to basically uh, slag off Islam. You have to say that this is a primitive med medieval ideology and so on and so forth. We have to move ahead. Or if you are being a bit more nuanced, you can say we have to create a progressive feminist, uh, anti-patriarchal, anti-capitalist and so on and so forth Islam. And that is, uh, you will gain a significant position. So. It is within the, it is, it is there is, I mean, we, we talked about this, that is the Orientalism of the West is pretty much alive and thriving among the Western left or among the left or all sorts of left ideologies. So when we are talking about some sort of a unified struggle, it's, it's, yeah, it's not possible. It is not possible because of the Orientalist roots of the uh, Western left. What left? Oh, you're talking about the rebirth of the Holy Crusades, of which, are, much. which are left. Are, no, which what are left I'm saying is that they never died. As brought into. It's a crusade against Islam. Yeah. It's a Christian crusade against Islam, which is what is happening in Europe. Mm. Um, it, this reemergence fact, uh, as you quite rightly point out, there's something innately evil about Islam. Um, it's a threat to civilized white Europe. Um, and it must be countered. So, so the anti-terrorist laws are just a holy crusade, modernised, you know, um, and uh, that, that, that's the real issue. Uh, this divide and rule stuff, it's very, very powerful. I mean, uh, I would have liked to have seen the Asians get involved in the Windrush campaigns, and I know a few Asians did, like Name and I think, uh, well, me as well, and also the black community get involved in uh, Islamophobia, but it just didn't happen. There was no, uh, there was no, con it was like there was no uh, leadership in these, in the, in the communities to bring them together and form a block. I'm, I'm having problems hearing people. Is that just me or other people? <clears throat> no, just you. <laughs> what are you finding? Is cutting off or you?